As I've described elsewhere, there are multiple models for how life's diversity arose to its current condition. Um, there is an evolution model, there is a creation model, there is an intelligent design model. In science, it's appropriate to doubt, to question, to, prom uh, to propose alternate explanations. But then the next step is then to test those. Does the evidence support the prediction of any of these models? Uh, this video is going to focus on uh, tests which could be performed to uh, look for genetic support for uh, these uh, models. And it's going to be an overview, as you might get of the impression as I zip through videos, that there is far more information there, especially with, say, gene families, um, but that this would perhaps be more appropriate you know, for students in a more advanced uh, course, or after this introduction to, you know, maybe pursue certain topics uh, in greater detail. I'd like to give kind of a more cursory treatment of this first. So, in the creation model, humans suddenly appeared, and they are unrelated to all other organisms, all right, so that no other organism has any biological connection to humans, since humans appeared from nowhere independently from everything else. All other life is 100% unrelated uh, to humans and equally unrelated to humans. So humans would be 100% unrelated to trees, to fungi, to bacteria, but then also to mice, to um, primates, uh, to fish. There would you know, be this complete 100% um, uh, disconnect between you know, humans and other organisms. If intelligent design is uh, correct, the major tenet of this model is that of irreducible complexity. The idea that you can't have some of the complexity, say, in complex humans in these other organisms. We shouldn't find you know, these other organisms with some but not all of the components genetic components in, in this consideration um, that make humans uh, complex. Um, evolution uh, holds the opposite of these. And as we then start to then compare genes uh, from one organism uh, to uh, the next, um, we uh, easily observe that the genes we find in humans are found in other organisms as well. Even though humans are so very different from, say, that fruit fly, or from a single-celled amoeba, or yeast, or a bacterium. Nevertheless, some of the genes which humans use, like rhodopsin, to, which we use to perceive light you know, for our complex way of seeing the world, can be found in very simple organisms which are using it to detect light without that vision. Um, the potassium, calcium, and sodium channels, which we use for our complex brain to conduct uh, electricity, you can find those in organisms which don't have, have brains. Um, the same uh, genes we use to prevent cancer as we regulate the cell cycle can be found in other organisms, etc. In fact, the reason that we understand human genes as well as we do, because you know, humans are so complex, if humans were unique, then studying humans well enough to understand the human genome, this would have been just an enormous undertaking. But luckily, human genes are known in other organisms like fruit flies, E. coli, yeast, etc. And so therefore, once genes were identified in simple organisms, then it was easy enough to say, all right, now that we know what the gene looks like, do humans have any version of this? It turns out we do. Now that we know that what the protein looks like, can we make a probe to see if vertebrate embryos are expressing any of the proteins that are expressed in, say, fly embryos? And the answer is that we do. And so when one studies, say, fruit fly um, mutations, many of these are then genes which humans also have, even though we are so very different from flies. And many of the human genes were first discovered in flies. If it weren't for studying flies or yeast or E. coli, we would know less about ourselves um, because we wouldn't know where to look, what the sequences to probe for would be. Uh, and so therefore, it is obvious that humans share genes with other organisms because in many cases, it was 
find, finding these genes in other organisms, which then allowed us to, uh, uh, to identify these in humans. So there were these eye pigment genes. Uh, what causes these uh, different colors? It turns out uh, mutations in proteins known as ABC cassette transporters. Humans have those, to, uh, which transport, say, cholesterol um, to HDL particles affecting our uh, risk of uh, heart disease, or in cancer cells affecting, say, chemotherapy. We have GST enzymes, which affect um, predisposition uh, to uh, asthma. Many of the transcription factors found in fruit flies, like VAR or Antenopedia, belong to gene families, which we have, and we now understand because of uh, finding them first in fruit flies. So we are certainly not unique uh, in uh, organism. It does not appear that humans are unrelated to other organisms because other organisms, even simple one-celled uh, amoebas or the far simpler bacteria, then have these uh, uh, genes. And lots of people then study them to get a better handle on uh, the diseases which cause uh, uh, the, the genes which cause diseases in uh, humans. Now, um, it is not just that we have these genes. Um, the genes uh, uh, that help humans become humans and function in the complex human ways um, are often uh, expressed in similar ways in other organisms. And so, um, it is not just that you know other organisms have these genes, like the genes for, say, oxytocin and neurofycin. Um, it is that there are uh, similarities in where they are produced, their functions, and uh, we see uh, that the uh, idea of irreducible complexity uh, does not apply. Now, you might say, well, I mean, wouldn't you expect some sort of similarity in say humans because you know our hair is like the hair of other uh, animals or we eat the same foods or breathe the same air, might not some similarities come from that? Well, I, I, I'd like to focus for the next couple of videos on hormones because hormones are just signals. So for example, here's a signal, what does that mean? Well, it could mean, hey, I'm doing good. It could also mean if you're scuba diving, I'm having a problem, let's go up. So if you're scuba diving, that does not mean you're good. That means you're good. If you do this to your partner, that means you need to go to the surface because there's an emergency. Um, so signals can be anything as long as the other person recognizes it as a signal. In the same way, this could be a signal. Any molecule could be a signal as long as a cell perceives it as such. So you might say, oh, well, doesn't hair have to have a specific form? Well, no, given you know, the bristles on tarantulas and caterpillars are completely unrelated to, to um, and mammalian hair. But apart from that, hormones are easy examples because they're just locks and keys. If the hormone fits the receptor, it works. So there's no structure that it has to have. So if we're to say, consider this one, oxytocin, there is no reason to consider that other animals would have to have oxytocin because it's just a signal. Other animals, if they were 100% unrelated, would then, they could then have uh, hormones and signals which were 100% uh, uh, unrelated. There are no similarities expected, and there are certainly no pattern of similarities that even if multiple organisms did have oxytocin, there would be no expectation that say, the sequencing, so mammals would be more similar than it would in other uh, animals. Because mammals use oxytocin for such complex events, so oxytocin is the signal for orgasm, it is the signal for uterine contractions in live birth, it is the uh, signal for the ejection of milk. Some of these are mammal specific. Would you expect that non-mammals, which don't give live birth or don't produce milk, would they use oxytocin? Well, in the irreducible complexity model, you wouldn't because if design, uh, if that model then is true, no animals could have some, but not all of the features of a more complex group, but they do, all right? There are homologous hormones in 
um, invertebrates, which don't have live birth or which don't uh, produce uh, uh, milk, um, which nevertheless are similar to uh, oxytocin. Uh, and so uh, we see similarities that the other models simply do not uh, predict. We see similarities in um, uh, uh, animals which aren't uh, humans in where they are uh, uh, produced. Uh, and so uh, we can uh, see it uh, uh, as um, we get into, say, the mammalian brain um, being produced in uh, the uh, hypothalamus, released from the posterior pituitary, but even more complex things. So it turns out oxytocin is a signal. It could just be made as a plain old signal, but it's actually connected to a second signal. And this one protein then gets cleaved to make oxytocin and neurophysin, say two separate hormones coming from the same parent molecule. There is no reason that that has to be exist. Uh, these could just as easily be two separate genes. But not only is that the case in humans, it's the case in other animals uh, as well. So other animals can have the same gene as humans. Um, it can be uh, made in the same precursor form, made in the same parts of the brain, have the same function. Um, once again, this simply does not meet the creationist prediction that our genetics would be 100% unrelated to other animals. Even if we have oxytocin, we could all have the same oxytocin neurophysin sequence, whether it be the DNA sequence or the uh, amino acid sequence of the protein. But what we find is that when we sequence these you know, genes or these proteins, that there are patterns that put humans in together with chimps, in together with other apes, then with catarine primates, then with uh, live birth mammals, then with uh, mammals in general. And so you could do this yourself. Um, just go onto a genome site. You can get uh, a sequence of a molecule and then go to another site where you can blast it. If you just type blast nucleotide, you can copy and paste the nucleotides and then see, all right, the sequence for the oxytocin neurophysin uh, gene in uh, humans, does it look like anything else that we know of? And you find, yes, there's all sorts of oxytocin neurophysin sequences. Um, here, the chimpanzee sequence is 98.4% identical. That of gorillas, 97.6. Uh, uh, so there are similarities. That is only predicted in the evolutionary model. There is a pattern of similarities where the apes have great sequence similarity to that of humans. Um, then catarine primates and apes share great uh, sequence uh, similarity to the point where all of the sequences which are more than 95% identical to that of humans are from either catarines, um, uh, which are, are catarines, which are either old world monkeys or apes. Um, to a lesser extent, mammals are uh, uh, similar in their sequences, uh, et cetera. Here is a pattern which is un not predicted by the creationist model in which all organisms are equally unrelated. In that model, humans are just as unrelated to uh, the apes as they are to uh, uh, non-primate uh, mammals, but that is not what is observed. And so simply, the data simply does not support uh, the creation and design models, but strongly supports the predictions of the evolution model. Now, this could be an enormously long video. I'm going to try to keep it as you know, short as I can, um, because there are thousands of, um, tens of thousands of genes in humans alone. We could keep on testing. So our growth hormone, for uh, example, do other animals have growth hormone? It turns out that they do, all right? And so humans are not unique when it comes to, to growth hormone. You know, lampreys have growth hormone. Uh, sharks have growth hormone. This seems to be a vertebrate um, uh, hormone. Um, uh, it is secreted from the anterior pituitary. And so uh, there are not just do other animals have these genes, um, but where are they produced? What is their function? Uh, this is shared. 
if we were to look then at sequences, um, you could um, see, ah, there is a pattern. So not only do humans have similar sequences, and in the sequence, each of these letters represents an amino acid. So these are of the proteins. Um, and proteins are made of chains of amino acids, and we give each amino acid an abbreviation. So M would be methionine, H would be histidine, uh, et cetera. Um, and then we would see a pattern with apes having the closest um, similarity to humans. Now, uh, I'll have bigger comparisons at the end with thousands of genes uh, compared. So if you were just to comparing one, you know, chimps and, and uh, gorillas are the most closely related to humans. You might find one study where, you know, the chimp is the, the closest and gorilla slightly less so, and another um, a study where uh, the reverse is true. Um, there are reasons for that, like the random uh, occurrence of mutations, differing natural selection, uh, et cetera. Uh, the patterns, which I'll introduce towards the end, those are overall uh, patterns using thousands of, um, uh, of genes. Um, and so once again, uh, you could just keep on uh, going and you uh, could do this uh, yourself on those same genome sites. So do other animals have other humans like insulin? The answer is, is, is yes, they do. And so um, this one prediction, do other animals have the same uh, genes as uh, we do? They do. Um, are they made in the same places? Uh, well, in, for example, vertebrates, um, uh, yes, you would find uh, uh, these uh, sequences uh, being uh, produced in the uh, endocrine portion of the pancreas. But unlike the predictions of intelligent uh, design, you know, there's this gradual change where, you know, the earliest uh, vertebrates, uh, you know, and then things like hagfish today uh, would have had simply endocrine cells in the intestinal lining that the endocrine and exocrine uh, portion of the pancreas were not the same um, at, uh, were not at, uh, at first. Now, uh, in addition to hormones, there are signals used in embryos. So for example, there's a, a signal uh, that helps the vertebrate, uh, I'm sorry, the human embryo become human known as sonic hedgehog. It's named after uh, a gene hedgehog found in fruit flies. Um, uh, and uh, when it was asked, do humans have a homologous uh, form, it turns out that they do. Well, it turns out this signaling mo molecule, which is a modified version of uh, a gene which can be found in uh, fruit flies, it's very important in, um, in not only human embryos, um, but vertebrates in general. So it helps humans uh, to decide where to put their arms, but it also then tells a chicken where to put its wings. And so uh, uh, with, intelli uh, with uh, intelligent designs idea of uh, irreducible complexity, um, that these signals existed in simpler um, animals. I mean, Sonic Hedgehog going uh, back to, um, uh, uh, to uh, flies and uh, before. Now, if you see the amino acid sequences, once again, the creation model is that humans are 100% unrelated to chimps and gorillas, but yet the, uh, this signal, which helps the human embryo become human, is more than 99.5% identical to the same signals being produced in the embryos of these apes. Once again, these signals are just locks and keys. If humans and chimps were separate, um, then the human signal, which would then only have to fit the human receptor, could be completely different from the uh, signal in uh, other uh, animals. Uh, when it comes to transcription factors, these are proteins which allow, um, which bind to DNA and decide which genes should be turned on. This is very important in human embryos because human embryo cells have all human genes. They then have to decide which do we express. So humans use transcription factors for human embryos to become humans using things like homeodomains, which can be divided into subfamilies like six genes, PAX genes, the um, 
uh, the Hox uh, uh, cluster uh, genes, etc. Um, but it turns out that we learned about these in studying flies. Not only do flies have the, the big family of homeodomains, like we do, they have the subfamilies uh, that uh, we uh, do. They express them in the same place. So, you know, like Pax genes being expressed in the eye of embryonic humans and embryonic flies. Um, that certain genes, the Hox cluster genes, occur in a row and the order of genes in the row of the, the uh, uh, in uh, the fly genome then correlates to where in the body they are expressed. So the first genes are expressed early in say the head, the middle genes in the middle portion, et cetera. Well, humans have Hox clusters um, as well. We have four of them, all right? So what appears to have happened to give humans their complexity in embryos is that these embryonic transcription factor genes, which then help to program the body plan of the, uh, of the individual, uh, what existed as one cluster in fruit flies, then duplicated once to make two clusters and then a second time to make four clusters. And so therefore the human genes we have a Hox A cluster, a Hox B, a Hox C, a Hox D. And once again, if you were to compare the sequences, once again, we see this pattern of, uh, of similarities where our instructions on how to become human are most similar to those instructions, say, found in apes um, um, uh, uh, for their uh, sequences. So I've been focusing on hormones and transcription factors because one could argue they don't have to have a specific uh, order uh, or, or a structure. It's not like, you know, say collagen, you might argue, oh, well, you know, this structure helps it do its job. You know, these are more locks and keys. They don't have to have uh, a specific uh, structure, but the fact that they do then shows that um, there is a relationship where uh, the uh, creation model predicts that there would not be. Um, and these transcription factors, you know, can uh, then be the ones which program uh, human embryonic development, you know, or even things like the FOXP2 transcription factor, which is important for language. So this is an important transcription factor for human language, um, but it's not unique to humans. Humans are just using a modified version of this uh, gene, which say chimps have. Chimps have a very similar uh, uh, gene. And, and so um, the uh, development of, of human language seems to just kind of be a modification of the existing uh, forms. Some of these genes are so similar to each other that you can do something known as, say, mutant rescue. Or let's say you have a fruit fly which has a mutant phenotype because there's a protein that it does not make. Let's say that you say, all right, let me cut and paste the human gene into the fly to see if the human gene is sufficient now to rescue that mutant, to give the mutant fly its um, wild type phenotype. Very often it is. So it's hard to argue that humans are 100% unrelated to flies. If human genes can substitute for fly genes and restore wild type um, phenotype in mutant flies. All right, and so there are lots of, you know, once again, all of this would be based on evidence published in um, papers. And so uh, if you had questions on this, you should investigate. Uh, and there are many uh, examples of, um, uh, of uh, genes which are so similar that they can actually be substituted. And if you wanted to, once again, by, by no means take my you know, word for it, you know, then do your own searches, all right? And so just type in words like rescue, mutation, prosophila, human. And even in the title, you'll get uh, some results even without reading um, uh, papers. So as uh, we look at uh, these, we see that other organisms have the genes that humans do. And their sequences um, then uh, form a pattern of similarities. Evolution not, not only predicts um, similarities, 
but a pattern of similarities. Once again, if humans and uh, chimps uh, are the closest biological relatives, then they should share the greatest uh, uh, genetic similarity. So when it comes to the beta hemoglobin uh, gene, a human and chimp sequences are identical. There is one difference uh, with uh, gorilla sequences. Uh, there are two differences with orangutan um, sequences, um, uh, et cetera. Um, well, one could then extrapolate out and then start, you know, just comparing um, sequences and asking what relationships do we see? And when we then uh, extrapolate out, we get the same pattern of taxonomic grouping that we find in, say, anatomy, where we get, you know, that primates are a real group, all right, that uh, within the primates, anthropoid primates are a real group, that uh, catarine primates are a real group, apes are a real group, etc. That's the conclusion you get from studying anatomy. But when you study um, gene similarities, you get the same pattern. Now, in the creation model, humans, there are three species of humans whose DNA we have, two fossil, um, uh, their DNA is not unrelated to those of other species, nor is it equally unrelated. Notice that humans, uh, chimps and gorillas form a group. The apes form uh, a group. The catarine primates form a group. The anthropoid primates form a group. There is a pattern of relationships which only the evolutionary model predicts. This is the exact opposite of what the creation model predicts, um, which claims that there would be no pattern, that humans are equally unrelated to all other organisms since their origins were separate from uh, all uh, other ones. That simply is not what the evidence supports. And we are lucky to live in an age where biotechnology and understanding of, of genetics has exploded. I would argue that no field of human knowledge has increased uh, the amount of, uh, of knowledge faster than genetics and molecular biology in uh, the past you know, 50 years, 100, um, 100 years. And so there are lots of sequences. So if you have an alternate model, you should test it. And luckily, there's all of this data that you can access online. These are in databases, and you can run your own comparisons. Um, so you could say, you know, are, uh, you know, dogs related to wolves? Are dogs and wolves related to foxes? Are dogs, wolves, and foxes related to bears? Are bears related to each other? Are bears and cats related to each other? And then you would find that there is not only anatomical support for this great family tree of life where we have an order carnivora that gets divided into suborders and families and genera and species, but that the gene sequence comparisons support the same um, taxonomic uh, groups. So that is what we would get if we compared the gene sequences of another mammalian group, not just mammals, um, but uh, carnivores. But we would get the same results if we study the sequences of birds. Once again, the creation model holds that a lot of these are 100% unrelated to each other, and there is simply no support for that. The support is that the family tree of birds gradually unfolded over time, that birds form a group related by common descent. And within uh, that uh, group, we have orders and suborders and superfamilies and families and genera, um, uh, et cetera. And so the nested hierarchy of relationships, which anatomical evidence supports and the fossil record supports, is supported by genetic uh, comparisons as well. And one sees this nested hierarchy, whether one is studying families or orders or and you know entire uh, groups, you know like birds or you know mammals uh, in uh, general, uh, etc. So here's looking at all mammals, right? Uh, genetically speaking, mammals form a group. Uh, full of a nested hierarchy of subgroups which are related 
Whereas, once again, uh, the other models would predict zero relationship between these uh, groups. I have other um, videos uh, which uh, go through the same nested hierarchy uh, which uh, results when you look at reptiles, when you look at insects, when you look at plants or fungi or uh, bacteria. And these are just samples of the thousands of genetic uh, uh, sequence analyses uh, which have been performed. So once again, having an alternate model, well, that's wonderful. And it is our responsibility uh, as scientists to doubt, to question, and to come up with alternate uh, models. Um, but then one tests these. And there have just been an enormous number of genetic analyses uh, done, which allow us to evaluate the predictions made by models. Here you see uh, the relationships um, in uh, sequence comparisons in plants. Once again, nowhere is there evidence for groups having independent origins and being completely unrelated. All of the evidence uh, is for this nested hierarchy of, uh, uh, of uh, relationships. So there are just so many, just hundreds of thousands of scientific papers published, which then weigh in on this, that this is just the, the simplest of overviews scratching the surface. I'd like to just make a few more uh, points. Um, one is that uh, intelligent design advocates often say, you can't get complex features in gradual steps. So take human immunity or the eye, or, um, or blood clotting, or uh, whatever, um, you couldn't get something which is complex and needs lots of individual components. You couldn't that get that evolving over time, because what would happen to an animal which just had some of the components of, say, you know, an immune cascade, or a blood clotting cascade, or vision? Um, if it just had some but not others, it wouldn't work, and the animal would just plain die. Um, and, and then there would be no value to it. Um, well, that's a rhetorical argument, which then, you know, and that's fine to propose those, um, but then one should test those. And the overwhelming conclusion of um, a genetic analysis is that irreducible complexity is simply not supported by the evidence. So if you were to take, um, say, the complexity of human immunity, human immunity is incredibly uh, ag ag complex. Um, and ask, are there any components of human an immunity which exist in um, uh, simple things like jellyfish, metazoan animals? And the answer is yes. They have some of the components of our complex immune reactions, but not all, just some. Like they have immunoglobulins. They don't have antibodies, but immunoglobulins are part of that family. Um, then you ask then bilaterally symmetrical animals. Oh, they have a few more, all right? And then if you ask, um, you know, higher bilaterally symmetrical animals, they have even more. If you ask, um, you know, deuterostomes and then chordates and they have a few more. And so the genetic analysis, in addition to anatomy and fossils, suggests this gradual branching of the lineage which would lead to humans. And it seems that at each point then, new features arose. So the first vertebrates, they had some, but not all of the features of the immune system that humans have. More than deuterostomes, but less than say jawed vertebrates. Jawed vertebrates have more, osteocleans have more, etc. So then even something as complex as um, the human immune system, the genetic analyses indicates it evolved in stages. And there are lots of examples of organisms which have some but not all of the features found in, um, in humans who ex uh, express this to a much uh, more complex uh, degree. Well, that was the immune system one would get the same results if then asked, you know, I mean, the cell membrane proteins, which we use for, for vision, for senses, for personality, for hormone responses, for the electricity that composes a uh, nervous system. 
um, oh, bacteria have some of these, all right? And then eukaryotic cells have some more, and then animals have some more, metazoan animals have some more. Once again, if this is the branching of a great family tree, one can find that some of the complexity of humans arose at this branch, while uh, some of the complexity of humans arose at other, um, at other branches. So unlike the predictions of irreducible complexity, we see that complexity can develop in stages. The genes which we use for electricity in our brains and muscles existed in animals which didn't have brains and muscles. Um, the uh, 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 GPCRs which we use to detect light in eyes existed in animals which didn't have eyes. And so this is just very superficial. You can go, go into in far uh, greater um, uh, detail. Uh, but this we see throughout, that that nested hierarchy of relationships um, supported by both genetics and anatomy and the fossil record. Um, this then shows that complexity can develop in stages. If you're asking how do we stop cancer and control our cell division, um, there are some genes which evolved in early eukaryotes, which are, are, were not present in bacteria. Then there would be more genes which evolved in animals and metazoan animals not um, at present in simpler uh, eukaryotes, uh, etc. And so the genes which humans use for their complexity seem to have evolved in gradual stages in lots of organisms which have some, but not all of the features uh, in complex humans. One of the significant things which we can see in modern humans and other organisms is gene duplication. Every now and then, a gene by an accidental mutation duplicates itself. And then very often these exist in a chain. You see you know, these chains of modified duplicates of each other. Um, so for example, uh, while most humans have one red gene on the X chromosome to perceive red light and one for green light, green and red opsins, um, some humans can have as many as four red genes or as many as seven uh, green uh, uh, genes because that's just one of the mutations which can make one individual different uh, from uh, another. Um, um, but we then see that uh, this is part of what has allowed uh, the complexity of more uh, of organisms to increase because as genes duplicate, they can then subsequently modify, forming what's known as a gene family. All right, so that you know maybe bacteria have one of a certain gene, but then it duplicates, and now later you know organisms then have two or four different kinds, and then later there's eight, and if now there's more genes, then you could then modify them in different ways so that they're slightly different versions of the ancestral gene, performing different functions. So, for example, humans have globins which are carrying oxygen to our brains, you know, in the form of hemoglobin. But it turns out bacteria, they have globins, plants have globins. So globins are very ancient genes, all right, going back to, you know, one-celled organisms. So sure, humans use them with red blood cells to carry oxygen to brains, but globins existed in bacteria long before there were brains or red blood cells. And the way that the human globins achieved their diversity, uh, and we can see this in other organisms as well, is by duplication. So if one ancestral gene then is duplicated, and then subsequent mutations then cause additional changes, you have then related genes which have come from duplications of one ancestral uh, gene. And so as we can see with the globins, all right, that from an original globin in vertebrates, we now have multiple globins. So there's a cytoglobin gene found on chromosome 17, a neuroglobin gene found on chromosome uh, 14. Um, then there was a gene which was ancestral both to myoglobin and hemoglobin, but it duplicated so that myoglobin, which binds oxygen and holds it in muscle, is different from the hemoglobin, which does the same in red blood cells. 
the hemoglobin for red blood cells was then duplicated to form an alpha globin and a beta globin. These then were duplicated to find chains of genes uh, all in um, a row. Uh, so that on chromosome 16, we have a sequence of alpha hemoglobin uh, uh, duplicates in that subfamily. On chromosome 11, there is a series of duplicates uh, for uh, beta hemoglobin. And so this is what we observe in the human genome. We do not have individually crafted genes, um, each for you know, one specific function. Instead, what we see are modified duplicates of ancestral genes. So the human genome, which has say between 20 and 25,000 genes, has over a thousand of what are called the G protein coupled receptors. Some perceive smell, some perceive taste, some perceive light in the eye, some bind neurotransmitters in the brain, some bind hormones. Now, they don't have to, all right? Because all of these, if we're talking for the most part about locks and key mechanisms, each of these could be separate individually crafted. And one would expect that if say the creationist model was true. But they seem to be modified duplicates. What allows us to smell in our nose and see in our eyes and detect neurotransmitters in our brains and detect hormones on white blood cells. These are all modified versions of ancestral GPCRs. By duplicating genes and then modifying the duplicates, we have achieved our genetic diversity. And it turns out that humans our genome is full of these gene families. There are hundreds of kinase genes. There are hundreds of zinc finger transcription factor genes. There are hundreds of homeo domain uh, um, uh, uh, family uh, genes. This is actually one of the most profound uh, discoveries in the, in the genome studies, like the human genome and those of others, just to what degree our genes are not these individual separate you know, entities, but rather modified duplicates of ancestral genes. And very often these duplications occurred in the distant past and we can find um, uh, then the modified uh, versions in other organisms, whether it be flies or bacteria, uh, et cetera. So there are just so many ways that genetic comparisons can, um, uh, can be used to test the various predictions of these uh, models. Let me just kind of wrap up here in that we can study the actual genes which are playing roles in speciation. When Charles Darwin published his book, The Origin of Species, he was trying to argue that there was biological mechanisms for how species could form. We now can study, here's an individual gene whose variation between, say, Drosophila melanogaster and Drosophila simulans is contributed to their being separate species, even though to human eyes, they look to be the same. So there are genes playing roles, and, and, and we can study uh, that. Very often, chromosomal differences are playing uh, roles, where when you ask, why are these lemurs you know, different species. Well, it could be that they have differing numbers of chromosomes within this lemur family, or that there's differences in chromosomal structure, where one has had a duplication of a chromosomal segment or a deletion of a uh, chromosomal uh, segment. We can see this uh, can be, you know, contributed variations uh, between individuals in the same species, between species in the same genus, between genera in the same families. We can even see it between humans and our closest ape relatives, because while we have 46 nuclear chromosomes, they have 48. What appears to have happened is that two small ape chromosomes fuse together to form human chromosome two. So once again, this is just a molecular mechanism which we can observe but it seems to have a role in the formation of a new species, including our own. Not only can genetic comparisons then point to genes which can play roles in speciation, so the origin of new species, 
uh, which was once again Darwin's book, um, we can see that there are specific genes which contribute to this and study that speciation here. Or we could study the same when we compare, say, human and chimp genomes. We know the human genome. It has been sequenced. We know the chimp genome. It has been sequenced. And we can then compare. Is there anything here which could not uh, evolve through natural mechanisms? We know what types of mutations occur in nature. There can be substitutions, deletions. There can be chromosomes which fuse, chromosome fuse pieces. There can be transposons which insert uh, themselves. There can either be even be genome duplications, you know, producing, say, tetraploid species. All of these are natural mechanisms which we can observe. Is there anything there um, that uh, between humans and chimps which is beyond that, beyond which can occur naturally? And the answer is no. In fact, the differences be between, say, the human and the chimp genome, it's about what you would expect in two closely related species who have been separated for say five to seven million years. So the level of genetic difference between humans and chimps is nothing. And so while the longer is be a good time to, uh, to wrap this up, but to sum up the creation model holds that humans, chimps, fruit flies, et cetera, are 100% unrelated. There is certainly no evidence of that. It's actually an understanding of these other organisms which have helped us understand ourselves so well. Um, not only uh, does the creation model predict uh, zero similarities, it predicts no pattern of similarities if all organisms are equally unrelated. But one of you know, the most obvious things is that humans share more with apes than with you know, lemurs and general primates, and more with primates than with mammals, and more with mammals than with fish, more with fish than with invertebrates, more with invertebrates than with plants, etc. So there is certainly a pattern which is evident, whether one's comparing the presence of genes, the sequences of genes, um, etc. The idea of irreducible complexity holds that you can't have organisms which have some but not all of the features of, say, complex humans or a complex a genetic uh, mechanism. And the answer, that's simply not observed, all right? We find lots of animals which have some but not all of the genes that humans use in their nervous systems or in their blood clotting cascades or in the uh, physiological mechanisms of vision, uh, et cetera. And we can identify, it appears that there was a gene duplication here, you know, there are multiple options allowing for color vision that arose here, et cetera. You can point to specific places in this tree where organisms um, got a new gene through duplication or modified a new uh, gene, et cetera. And so you can see uh, the organisms which have some but not all of the features of, um, of complex humans. And certainly our genome seems to be full of these gene families, not you know, genes which appeared from nowhere, but rather genes which appeared as modified duplicates of ancestral genes. And so genetic analysis provides simply overwhelming support of the predictions made by the evolutionary model and overwhelming evidence against the predictions made by the creation and intelligent design model.